Are you living the life you want? Spending enough time with the ones you love? Welcome to the Real Estate of Mind show where you'll learn how becoming a successful real estate investor can change your life like it did ours. We're here to help you reach all of your goals and create wealth through real estate investing. So let's roll. All right. Welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show with your host, Glenn and Amber Sharma, where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. Hello, everybody. Did I mispronounce my name? Now? I think you did. I don't know how Sorry, I mispronounced my own, my own last name there. I said, sure. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but Glenn and Amber Schwarm. <laughs> but our guest last name. I, I think I was. I, yeah. It was the, was. And the minute I left my tongue, I'm like, the hell is that? I can't say my own name. <laughs> anyway, so that's 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 how we roll <laughs> here. At the, yeah, yeah, that's how we roll here at the Real Estate of Mind show. So anyway, we are glad to have you guys here today. And we have a, a special guest, kind of a unique guest on today. And I'm really glad we have her because it's going to give us a different perspective on real estate investing. And um, I want to take a second to introduce her first. So uh, Terry is with us today, Terry Shower. And before we say hi to her, I want to tell you, she is a uh, real estate professional and coach, and she is in Canada. So she is uh, an international uh, investor uh, for as far as we're concerned. She's local through for where she invests herself, but also the author of The Mindful Landlord. It has a pretty great story we want to share with you guys, hopefully inspire you guys to, uh, to reach your goals. So Terry, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me on. I think you had so much anxiety about pronouncing my name that you got your own name wrong. <laughs> it's the whole international thing. It just threw me a little bit. So it's like, it just threw me. So tell everybody where you're, uh, where you're from in Canada. So I'm located in uh, Montreal, which is the biggest city in the French part of Canada. So we're just pretty much over New York. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you before we got started here, that's where, you know, that's only about three hours, two and a half, three hours from where Amber and I, from where I grew up and Amber and I lived for 15 years within the Albany, New York area. So I spent a lot of my summers in Canada. I've got family in Canada up. You ever hear a place called Sault Ste. Marie? Yep. So I, we, there's a little tiny place called Blind River. You've probably never heard of it, but it's a little lake up there. I forgot the name of the lake. It's a little tiny town and my family owns property up there. And all summer we used to, that's where they went. They lived in Michigan. And they went up there. So I spent a lot of my summers up in Canada. So great, great memories up in Canada. Cold. I know that. Colder than New York even feels like sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but good stuff. So tell us a little about your journey. I think it's very interesting because you um, were brought up in Canada. Then you said you uh, lived in Europe for a while. And then yeah. came back. Let's talk about that. So I lived in Montreal until uh, I was about 19. And then I went away um, and studied in, in Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, in Canada. And then after that, uh, I went on this uh, kind of uh, interesting journey as a, a semi-pro kickboxer. Well, I got an opportunity to kind of take that, you know, follow that, that, that part of that path or that part of my life, let, let's say. Um, and that took me to France. Um, and uh, actually at that point, I was kind of, you know, thinking about doing real estate more professionally as well. And I needed a day job. So I got myself a job in a property management company uh, when I, where I lived in Marseille. And that was kind of like a, a turning point when, you know, I had owned, uh, I think, a couple of triplexes before I left. But that was kind of the inflection point when I decided, OK, um, this is what I want to do kind of as my main gig, right, to, to become a property manager. And then it came to the point where I wanted to do that as a business. And, um, you know, I thought about doing it in France, but, uh, in Europe, there's a lot of red tape and it's very difficult to start a business. It's very difficult. You know, a lot of people who've been doing things or have been in the market for 200 years and you show up as a foreigner, uh, kind of out of nowhere with the wrong accent. It's very difficult. And, uh, well, you say 200 years, you, you don't think about that, but you're yeah. right. We were, we, yeah. we were here a couple of years ago. It's funny. Everything's so old there, right? It's just very, yeah. it's different than, I mean, the upstate New York definitely is old too. But it's still, it's still, it's not old like Europe old. It must right? have been so, yeah, within the last hundred years. Yeah, yeah. A lot of families yeah. do that. So you're kind of a badass in your own right, being a kickboxer. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty awesome. And you were semi-pro <laughs> at it. So you've got a lot of fight inside you, obviously, yeah. to win and to, and to succeed and everything. I'm sure that's, you kind of have to have that. But it was also insightful for you to know that, you know, kickboxing is not like a lifetime career. You, you age out yeah. of that at some point. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you thought instead of waiting till the last minute to change directions you were smart enough that while you were still doing your kickboxing that hey i need to have you know the next chapter of my life yeah. kind of yeah prepared. were you interested in real estate investing when you went to work for the property manager company or was that what sparked you uh, no. So I actually um, already owned a couple of triplexes in Montreal. Um, we have to sort of back up the story a little bit more, which is that basically- You were, like, you were young. You were 19. You yeah. Left no, I was young. I, I went away. So when I went away to school, I ended up managing the student housing 
I guess you could call it complex. It was really just a house, like the student house that I lived in, which had 15 rooms. And uh, I did that for a couple of years. And then um, one thing led to another. And, and I went back and knocked on dad's door and was like, dad, I've been doing this, you know, in this other incarnation for a couple of years. Do you want to help me with a down payment? And let's set this up and I can run it for profit. Um, and so that turned into a first triplex and then a second triplex. Then I kind of got the opportunity to, to pursue kickboxing a bit more seriously. It's not a big sport in Canada. So that's what led me to go to France. Um, and then, you know, at that point, I actually did a PhD, which again, has nothing to do with anything. But um, I came to the end of, of that chapter, sort of, and uh, had to decide, do I want to be a prof or do I want to do something else? And this opportunity to go to France, let me kind of hit the reset button. And I realized that like an academic life probably wasn't the right thing. And I'm like, okay, well, let me take this time to learn how to be a real estate professional so that eventually when I'm done with kickboxing, I can start my own company. Okay. So tell us how the journey went from there. So you, you came back where, tell us about your journey. I think it sounds like you do a little more do-it-yourself, hands-on management than we do. I always preach to do it off, but you have an interesting perspective that I want to talk about. Yeah, so, yeah. The, um, mindful, the mindful real, the mindful landlord, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> After, you know, whatever, 15 years of, of managing properties full-time. Um, yeah. So I came back and uh, I was uh, 30 at the time and decided, okay, well, like now I need to start a business. And I really didn't have any experience. I didn't really, you know, know what I was doing. So I printed a hundred business cards and, you know, went around door knocking. Actually, my, my main strategy at the time was to message people who had for rent ads. Um, because I figured that if they're having trouble renting their units, like I can help them rent the units and then that's going to turn into management business. And, um, that's kind of what happened. So from there, I built out, uh, you know, a small portfolio of stuff that I managed for clients. And I also, um, then managed to close on a third triplex, which were, they were all sort of in the same neighborhood. Um, and I, by then gotten tapped out of personal borrowing capacity. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I think it's, this is a bit similar to the U S but maybe not entirely. So like, here um, on single family homes, everything up to five doors, they lend it on your personal debt ratios. Um, and everything six doors and over is considered multifamily. And that ends up being like kind of a big stopper for people because most people like stay in the residential game and don't learn how the financing works and how transactions work in the multifamily space. So I like hovered there for 10 years with no real answers of how to trade out of, you know, being in the business of three triplexes. And I didn't have, you know, whatever the debt ratios to, to move beyond that. I also didn't understand joint ventures. Um, so that kind of stagnated. Fair, fair, but my I ask you a question just just because this is good yeah. for differences in the U.S. to Canada. So here it's one to four is considered residential, but you can also buy any single house in an LLC with a commercial loan. Can you do that in Canada? No, mm -mm. you can't. No, not the same way. Like when people have a certain amount of volume, um, the bank might consider them to be a professional operator. Like once you get to, you know, 10 houses or something, but it's actually very difficult to purchase what's considered those residential properties as anything other than a residential mortgage. And so what tends to happen is people will get up to, it's usually the magic number is three. They'll get up to three residential properties and then they end up moving into multifamily. So it's funny down, down here, I think they used to be four. Now you can get to 10 in your personal name finance by any any number of banks, but usually if in any government backed loans, FHA, I don't know if you have FHA or something like that up there, government backed. Yeah. So well, different language, funny, right? Different, yeah. different, uh, different stuff. But yeah, you can get up to 10 using your name. But yeah, you down here we can buy, we can buy a house in an LLC and have a commercial loan on that house. Cause we have mm -hmm. several that are like that. Like our, you know, we've got we have dozens of, of long-term rentals, but then we've also got a, a little over a dozen, thir four, 13 or 14 short-term rentals. Um, short -term rentals too. And they're each in their own, their, their own LLC and all that kind of stuff. So interesting, interesting dynamic, how that works up there. So mm. you know what I love about the story you just told, and I really hope our listeners pick up on is how freaking resourceful you were when you got started there, because, yeah. you know, a lot of people would have just if you wanted to get a pro be a property manager, you start applying for a property management position. You took the back door into it and said, you know what, I'm going to go look at those people that have houses for rent and see if I can help them rent them. Like you proved yourself to them. Very and, and, and that's just not the way the average person's brain works. You know, mm -hmm. it's, 
And so you really thought outside the box there and you came at it with a different approach. And I think that is critical in business today. No money for marketing. I mean, very little. You had 100 cards yeah. for it. You did it yourself, so some ink, right? So whatever it but, is. So yeah. But whatever business you're in or whatever career you want to go into, like you have to stand out because there's, you know, 10 more of you trying to do the same thing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you have to do things to stand out, whether it's, you know, doing something wacky to get a, I, I heard of a guy one time that, you know, sent a pizza to the people he was interviewing with and he had a note inside the box or the um, resume. I think it was inside the box. Yeah. I've heard the resume, yeah. the resume the on a bat one time. Yeah. So they had their resume engraved on a, on a nice bat, like for a, some, for some sports, whatever um, interview, it's like, well, you're going to stand out. But you have, to, you have to do things to stand out in this world to be noticed because, yeah. you know, the, the way we get information and the way we search out things has just completely evolved over the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. So yeah. I love, I, and I really hope our listeners picked up on that yeah. because I think that's really, really important in business. Yes. Knocking on doors. Yeah. My first business, yeah. I, you know, I was about 19 when I started my first company, I was knocking on doors, some alarm systems down here in the States. That's what I was doing. To, to open my business. So I respect the really what you were doing is knocking on doors. Yeah. You were looking, yeah. you were finding yeah. people. Now tell everybody this. I know it's a little bit probably down a rabbit hole, but like how many of those did you close? Like you met a bunch of people. Did everybody just say yes? Oh you my God. No, no. It was like a terrible, no, it was terrible. Right. Cause like you send out, you know, but, but I like, and I, you know, I'm a big, uh, I guess this comes from, you know, my sports background, but like, I'm a big believer in, you have to just, you know, set up the systems and like have confidence, have faith that over time they're going to work for you. And so that's what I, you know, I had my one hour of prospecting every morning where I was like, back then we had a, um, our equivalent of, of, uh, Craigslist is, uh, it's Kijiji. And so like, I was on there just like sending, you know, spamming every morning I would spam, spam, spam. And then I would have like, you know, the one or two phone calls of the one or two people that I knew, um, you know, that I would try to activate those contacts and kind of see what I could, I could do with them. Cause I didn't have a huge network at the time. And I think this is also like, you know, for your listeners, uh, kind of an important point. Um, you know, if you're younger and you're starting out, um, part of the thing is that your network might not be the biggest help to you because those are not the people who have money to invest. They're not the people who own properties. And so you're kind of at this awkward stage in your career where not only are you starting out, but you're also young and you can't tap into your own network. So it's like, you kind of have to, uh, you know, focus on older people, or maybe, you know, if you're, you're, um, how can I say your community is not necessarily that wealthy or doesn't have a culture of investing, you have to actually kind of move out of the circles that you're used to moving in, in order to build a real estate network. And so, you know, I was just at a, at a phase in my life where like my friends didn't, were not investing. So I had to really kind of, it took a lot of time to build that up. The people that got you here aren't the same ones that get you there, right? It's always, <laughs> Absolutely. It's you have, to yeah. get to the, you have to get to other people. Same with your team members, same with a lot of stuff like that. So very okay. cool. I think that's another good point that you just brought up there too, is how much rejection you had to go through yeah. to get to the goal. Because, you know, so many people, we, you know, let's face it, we live in an immediate gratification society. I mean, you know, you order something on Amazon and now, now I can be there in the same day sometimes. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, everything's on demand. It, it, on it was three hours and two, you're like, where's my stuff? I know, <laughs> you know, everything's on, like our, like as a kid, we had to wait for Wizard of Oz to come on every year, once a year and, and watch it. <laughs> now everything's on demand, you know, like yeah. we live in that, in that kind of environment these days. So, so to have to ha deal with that much rejection and still keep going. And again, yeah. that probably goes back to your sports background. I mean, you get knocked down when you're kickboxing, you get back up. Yeah. <laughs> you don't stay on the ground. Right. So, so. I think that's awesome advice for anybody. Terry, tell us where you went from there. So you, so you start building up that business. Tell us your journey yeah. from there. Yeah. So I, I built up the business. I, I did my broker's license as well. So I was doing, you know, like a low volume of transactions, uh, basically with my clients who were already part of my portfolio. And that I, I turned into basically that into a nice business of like a solo printer. Right. So like between, you know, my three buildings and my income as a solo printer, like I was pretty much financially independent at that time, but I, there was not so much growth perspective. Um, and, you know, in my management business, I kind of got to a point where I was comfortable, but I, any more business that I took on, um, with my structure as it was, I wasn't scalable, you know, like I was myself with, uh, you know, kind of one employee and we'd gotten it to where we were comfortable, but there wasn't like a whole lot of perspective to move on from there. Um, and then really like the next thing that allowed me to level up is I started, I became involved with the uh, real estate investors club, which is like that a uh, local organization here that does real estate education. And they actually got me to come in and teach property management. 
um, which I started when I only had nine doors, which is kind of funny. I mean, I had a bigger portfolio, but it's not like I was a huge investor. Um, right. And then through being in that environment, it really opened my eyes to all the other strategies that people can use to grow. Um, and that would be here. We do like, I, we call it joint ventures, but I think you guys call it syndication. Um, so associating yourself with other people and, uh, you know, bringing, if you're the one who brings the knowledge, then you, you know, get a disproportionate amount of the upside. Um, and also to understand how multi-residential financing works, because that's a real, that's when, you know, all of the, the buildings you purchase come off of your personal debt ratios. And then it becomes a question of how much capital you can raise. And then it becomes a different game because it's not about getting the bank to believe that your salary can support additional purchases. It's a question of getting access to capital and then financing those buildings in an interesting way. Yeah. Um, and then things have kind of, you know, snowballed from there. So now you, now you coach other people primarily in your local market. You help them, you guide them, kind of, they come to you, they know nothing and you take them right through the process. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, all of those, like kind of, um, if you think of it as different steps up the ladder, right? Like at each one of those steps, there's some lesson you need to learn. Like you want to close on your first condo or your first triplex, like realistically, that's how most people start. And it's, it kind of is a good place to start because we also have advantageous lending. Um, in the residential field. And so if you have a bit of income that the bank will follow you through, you're going to get better financing on that anyway. So might as well start with a smaller residential property, and then you can sort of scale up from there and then learn all the different things that, you know, I learned to basically become a, a career investor. Um, and I, you know, help people with that. Um, I would say that the, the other thing is like my secret sauce has always been the property management aspect. Yeah. And so when I coach people that ends up being, um, you know, the, the secret sauce they could learn from me, like some people are construction guys, uh, some people are creative financing people. Like I've really, you know, made my money through management. So let me ask you this question. So it's funny because we, we put on, you know, we, we have our home flipping workshop we put on and we, we, I'm, I'm because I don't like property management at all. We did it on our first, we bought our first house, what, 2003? Was our first two family, like that, yeah. and then so almost twenty years ago, and then you know that was just a oh my god, that was a horrible experience. That was just a, you know we had professional tenants in there, and they call the building department and blah. I'm like oh my god, you guys wouldn't pay the rent. I had to evict them, and that's back in New York. If you know about all the crazy laws in New York, you can't evict anybody for years now. They're it's just not, allowed to live. It's so not a landlord friendly thing. No, it's not. It's a nothing friendly. That's why we let we left. We don't live. In, by the way, we don't live there anymore. We live in the coast in Florida, so we're we're, we're way down now. But uh, down south now. But anyways, um, I would always preach to my uh, my pe my the students. I said, look, you know, hire a property manager company. Hire someone like you. Right? Hire a property manager to do that for you. Now we pay, I don't know what you guys charge up there for our portfolio. We pay eight percent to manage our portfolio of the of the rent. You know, plus one month's rent if they have to rent it. Is that similar to? Canada? It's like it's virtually the same. Like um, my my firm charges seven percent. Um, and the 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 uh, the spread is between f like five to 7%, but people who charge five charge a lot of extras. So it's just, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the same. We're, we're like eight to 10 because, because we had, I think we had, cause we have over 50 properties were, were less, but it's, we have one company that does it, but about four or five years ago, I said, well, we paid them how much? And it was like 50 grand for the year or something like that. And I said, we paid 50 grand. I go, we could hire someone to do that for 50 grand. My gosh, we could do that in house. Probably save a lot of money. <laughs> And I said, let me see what we did last year. And they gave me this, this booklet. And I looked through of all the invoices. And I got through about the first 10 invoices of, you know, locked out middle of the night, drain clocked, uh, eviction, uh, dead animal. I'm, I go, you know what? You guys are good. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. So I wanted nothing to do with that. But you take, <laughs> you take a different approach to it. And I have a, yeah. one of my best friends that works with us at the Home for the Workshop. I've been with us for a long time. He has, I don't know how many units he has now, 20 units or something like that. He manages half of himself. And I'm always riding him going, would you have a professional do that? Tell us why you think, I'm, I'm guessing you preach to do it yourself or you preach to, tell us that secret sauce. I want yeah. I told, I told you my Yeah, yeah I know. So thoughts. look, I'm, I, I don't think that the, it's a blanket statement to say you should do it yourself. Okay. Like I, I don't preach that to people. I think it's a question of character and I think it's a question of your business model. Um, and I think that, you know, everybody's very comfortable to sit down and be like, oh, like I'm a construction guy. And like my model is I do all my construction myself. And, uh, you know, that's how I save money. Right. Or that's how I control what happens to my building. Well, like property management is the same thing. And, you know, by me, by, by, uh, you know, managing in a very, uh, tight, have running a very tight ship. Um, it's a question of understanding your expense categories, cutting expenses where you can, and then you have to imagine 
like us, if you think New York has red tape, like New York has nothing on Quebec. Quebec is like really? New York. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like, we're, we're extremely tenant friendly here. And there's like so much red tape and so many laws. And like, um, you know, we have the highest percentage of renters in North America, actually. Um, Quebec Wait, does. Quebec? Yeah. Uh, wow. I think it's something like 45, 47% of households here are renters. Um, so there's like a lot of career tenants who very often know the laws better than the landlord does. Yeah. 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 And so, so, you know, like that, just understanding that ecosystem and being able to navigate it in in an effective way can be extremely profitable. Um, and you know, by, by involving myself in the minutia of that, uh, you know, that's been my business model basically. And so like, I'm able to coach people through that if they want to, or else, to have them know enough to manage the manager. And I think it's always a question of like, you know, the plumber, right? Like if you know enough about plumbing to know when he's telling, it doesn't mean I have to work with the pipes, but it means that if he's quoting me something that makes no sense, like I need to understand what is an appropriate quote and what is not just like my property manager. If you want to hire a manager, like I actually recently started uh, investing in a secondary market where I can't be the boots on the ground. So my firm still does the uh, admin from our Montreal office, but we have a local guy there who is doing all the on-site stuff. But like, you know, I, I need to know and understand his job well enough to question what he's doing and then to do the spot checks on the stuff to make sure that the work is actually getting done, that the tenants are actually getting the service they're supposed to. Is he picking up the phone? You know, and by just um, holding the person accountable and really knowing what the metrics are to look at, you can leverage that knowledge into making the management a place that you make money. So. I love that you said that there's not a blanket answer for everybody there because there's not a, there's not a one size fits all. We we all come to the table with strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, if your strength is to do that sort of thing, then by all means, you know, plug into the system and do it. But if it's not, then, you know, hire somebody else to do it. So I, I I love that you get that like statement. And I also love that line. You just used know enough to manage the manager. Yeah. Because that, and I, I think that's a really big pitfall that a lot of people get into is, thinking they have to know everything about everything. And, and then it becomes overwhelming because there's no way we can know everything about everything. There's no way we can wear every single hat in our business once it gets to, to a point where it's, it's growing and scaling. And so, but it is important. Like we, we always talk about how we did the work on the first three flips that we did. Um, and that was really, because neither one of us had construction experience or remodeling experience or anything like that. Yeah. So that was a really good, life experience that helped us in our business later on as we were hiring contractors so we knew enough to be dangerous we knew enough to know if we were you know being ripped off by contractors saying you know this is going to take me 17 days when it should take two so we we knew enough to know that so i I think that's really important for people to to understand as well yeah no and that is i mean that is one of the things that i recommend to my clients is you know because i (laughs) i recommend most of them to start with a small residential property i tell them like look I can take your money to manage it, but I'd rather you manage it. And if you get to 20 doors, like it's a different situation, but at least manage this property yourself for a year so that you know enough of how to control what someone else is doing. Because, you know, the manager, like you really are delegating a lot of power to that person, especially if it's in a secondary market, that's not near where you are, or if you don't regularly go by the properties, like no one can mess with your stuff the way the property manager can. And so it's very important to keep tabs on that because, you know, like I actually in that secondary market, the first manager that I hired really did a number on me. And like, I'm a professional manager, you know, we know know. it happens to anybody, we know (laughs) Yeah, it's almost worse when it happens to you, you know, like you're like, then you're like, I I can't believe I didn't make a decision. It's mostly it's about making a decision sooner, right? Usually it's like, you know, something you're like, it doesn't seem right, but maybe it's okay. I don't know if that's what it is, but that's usually with, with us. It's like, yeah. they get too far. You're like, ah, crap, they got me. So yeah. You know, so yeah, I know how that goes. Oh my gosh. Well, so this is, I, I think it's great for people to hear that, you know, kind of, I, I, I definitely like what you said. Um, I re- I repeat what Amber said about that's your secret sauce, but you're right. Everybody has a thing. I was thinking about, we have very good friends, Paul and Aaron, that um, uh, they are one of our son's godmother, actually Aaron is. And they helped us out in the early days, but they have 20 houses that they own, pretty much all free and clear on these houses they own. They do all the management themselves. They love, they're very, they don't sub anything out. They do it all themselves. And I'm always busting on them about that. But 
you know, there's there's a certain amount that's that they have full control over their world. That's what they do. My only argument with them is they can't ever leave. The, they can't ever leave their area. Right? They can't leave. They can't go away. They got They got to stay put with that. You know, they for any length of time because they can't. They they're kind of limited with that. But but besides that, that's what that's probably their secret sauce. What they're good at, and they put that extra call it a couple thousand bucks a month in their pocket where it could be yeah. going to a property management company. Right. But, but let me say like, it's really, it's not about the money. Right. Because like, honestly, like, you know, five to 7% here, it's like, that is not going to really radically change the economics of your business. So like, I don't think it should necessarily be painted as a nickel and diming. It's that like, I know for a fact, if I manage the building, I'm going to be able to up the value, for example, you know, by increasing rents in a specific way, by cutting expenses and with a multifamily unit, like every, because of the way it's financed, right? Like it's financed on multiple of revenues. So every hundred dollars that you're able to go get translates into times a hundred times 12 times 20. So it ends up becoming a lot of money. And like, if I just outsource that by, you know, doing this, I'm not concerned about the five to 7%. I'm concerned about the hundred, 200, $500 that I'm leaving on right. the table. Cause I don't understand that aspect of the business. You know, right. it's like letting yourself be overcharged by a contractor. Like, sure. It's more convenient to have someone else doing the work, but like, if you don't really know what's going on, you're going to get ripped off. And it's not only about the convenience. It's also about the financial impact of, of that decision-making. So, so let, you know, we're the real state of mind show as we start to wrap up here. Tell us, what do you do to keep yourself mentally strong? I love being a kickboxer. I can't wait to hear this answer, but I want to know what you do. You know, everybody has regimen that they do to keep themselves because we go through we go through all kinds of crap in our heads, don't we? I mean, we get beat up in this business. It's a, it's a, you know, I always tell people what we do is not easy, but it's worth it. You know, so it's uh, I want to know what you do to keep yourself strong mentally. Yeah. Well, so I mean, like I wrote the book, um, The Mindful Landlord. And I think we spent a lot of the interview talking about the landlord part, you know, um, actually the other part of my secret sauce is that mental training. Um, and so half of the book is actually a mental training program that helps people manage and optimize their mind as a performance tool to do real estate. And, you know, like, I think uh, some of the ideas are, are derived from Buddhism. Like I had a, a, you know, a meditation practice that I started uh, around the same time as I was competing, um, which really helped me overcome fear, um, you know, understand how to like manage social relationships better. Um, you know, so, um, how could I give you an example? Like, okay, so let's talk like a, a very simple mindfulness exercise, just because I want people to have an idea of, of what this is about. So, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced what's called monkey mind, which is your mind is like a monkey swinging from one branch to the next, going after the next <laughs> shiny <laughs> object. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, you know, not being able to stay on track. And yeah. so one mindfulness exercise is to just train your mind to always come back to the same point of focus. And typically we do that in meditating, but you can also do it doing whatever you want. Like if you decide to go out for a walk, be on the walk. Don't be with the kids. Don't be with dinner. Don't be with the shopping list, like be with the walk. And the fact of training your mind to stay you know, in terms of mindfulness, like that's really one exercise that can help you in whatever you do that you stay on track. So it's more focus, more productivity, but it's also more peace of mind because, you know, there's kind of different levels of consciousness and you can be with the present moment, or you can be in the spiral of your thoughts. And it's more effective to be in the present than it is to be up there with the chaos. Yeah. That our, our company, our coaching company, the tagline is a real estate of mind. That's our tagline on our company because everybody that's we, when we do our workshop. The funny part is we start the workshop and I say, listen, I want to before we the first three days, I want to get permission from you. <laughs> you know, do you think Amber and I after a thousand flips in 15 years have learned a couple of things? Like if we learned a couple of the people are like, yeah, okay. I said, so I'm going to take you down a road that you don't think is you don't think is important, but I'm telling you it's 80% of the deal. And I, I say that I, I'll ask, I'll ask the start. I'll say, you know, what's the most important part of a the house. They eventually get around to saying foundation. I say, what's the most important part of your business? They eventually get around to saying, well, I am. I said, good. So you're the foundation of your business. So let's work on you. And I, I take them on that mental path. We do a lot of exercises. And most everybody goes, I never thought about real estate investing like that before at all. And I, I'm like, they, they say, what, what's your secret? I say, my secret is you got to deal with this. If you don't deal with your mind, that's why I love to tell you your book, right? The, the mindful landlord. If you don't deal with your mind, Forget it. I mean, the the you know you you've got you've got to work on your mind. It's eighty percent of the gig, because really, 
But by and low, we're selling high. We're managing tenants. You're getting people in and out of houses. You're, you know, managing relationships. It's really not that complicated. It's how we deal with this. It's how we yeah. deal with the situation that makes all the difference in our level of success. The highs and the lows. Yeah, you got to manage it all right. Yeah, I'm having a great day. I'm having a horrible day. You know, you, you know if you you ride that ride, you're going to be in a bad way. So I I love that your book is titled that because that's a huge part of who we are, and that's. The problem is, you know, when you try and market that stuff online, people don't want to hear it most of the time. You know, like they, I have to get them in, like, you don't really find a lot of people follow that. They like to follow the train wrecks, right? That's what they like to follow all oh, the horror stories. Oh, Glenn never lost money in that deal. Let me watch that video. Ah, you know, when they, we do a motivational video, it's like, they get, we get like a couple hundred views. It's nothing great. It's like, gosh, nobody cares. You know, so it's very funny for me, yeah. at least for us, anyways. We find that, you know, people, but now once people get into our environment, probably like you too. Once they get in your environment and realize how important that actually is, <laughs> usually they're like, wow, what a, what a mind blowing exercise. Like I just didn't realize how important my mind is. Do you find that too? Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, you know, I, for me, the analogy I always use is, is like dieting, right? You cannot say that in today's information environment, people lack access to the information about how to eat right and exercise. The problem is up here. Like yeah. pretty much everybody knows what they would need to do to like, you know, lose the 10 pounds they want to lose or like do whatever it is. But they are, the issue is with staying on track and managing the decisions minute to minute that make it happen or not. And like real estate is no different, like not in, in not in any way. And like those barriers are mental barriers. It's yeah. not a problem of access to information. It's not even a problem of networking. Like most of the time it's people get in their own way about networking because they're too shy or they don't want to seem pushy or they don't want to be salesy. Yeah. Um, and that's again, a mental issue. Like actually, you know, being out there talking to people is not complicated. We do it all the time without realizing. So I know I a hundred percent agree with you. Well, it's, it's nice to meet someone that we, we share the same value when it comes to mindset. Cause that's such a, that's, it's huge. I think a lot of the younger investors who have, been, you know, I don't know what it's been like in Canada, but the last couple of years here has been insane with people that are just making all kinds of money and they, you know, in my, in our opinion, I'm like, well, I just wait for you guys to disappear because I know that it's, it won't take very long before they're, they're like, wow, this is hard now. Well, it's, this is more normal, this like a normal, normal, normal environment than what it's been. And so we've been around a long time. We know what these ups and downs look like, but, but I know that a lot of people won't, won't even be able to sustain because I don't know how, what it's like in the States or in Canada, the same thing, interest rates are all over the place and getting high and, you know, the market has changed. And so I think that if you don't have that mindset now, you're just not going to make it, you know, you either... Yeah. You've got to figure that out. You can die on me over here. I what? think so. Apparently. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Let, let me ask you, where? how can people find you? How can they connect with you? How can they re get your book? Let's talk about some of that stuff. Yeah. How they can connect yeah. with you. Uh, so look, I mean, the best way to connect with me, um, the my social media of choice is LinkedIn. So just, you know, look me up, Terry Shower on LinkedIn. Um, at pick up a copy of the book on Amazon or else it has its own website at uh, mindfullandlord.com. And um, that's really probably the best way to like get into my ecosystem. And from there, like you'll be able to, you know, learn about the podcast and, and kind of see the other stuff. But like, typically that's what I encourage people to do, you know, before you like approach me for expensive coaching, like check out the podcast, buy the book, and then come with informed questions afterwards, um, if you want to, you know, work on something specific, but rather access the free resources first. Yeah. I tell everybody now, I say, you know, it's, it's so important. Again, past couple of years, you can make a lot of mistakes and still make money in real estate. I don't think that's going to be the way it's going to be going forward. We're going to go back to more of a normal state where coaching is going to be crucial. I think people in your area for sure need to be able to reach out to you and say, look, I need help. You know, I need, you know, get, I think people that like us who have been around for a while, we can help people navigate the shark infested water right now and be very profitable, really take advantage of something now where a lot of people could lose money in this market too. Yeah. So yeah, I, think, well, actually, I think having a coach a, is really paramount right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I mean, just as a data point, like uh, if you think things are rock and roll in the States, Canada is actually in a worse position than you are. Um, we didn't have a correction in 2008 because of our banking is uh, much more restricted. So like we really didn't have go through the dip that you guys did. Really? Um, so we've had uninterrupted years of growth for a very long time. And we're actually on the top three overvalued and most indebted countries in the world. We're up there with Australia and uh, Sweden, I believe. Wow. Um, so they're talking about the biggest correction that, that we're actually one of the economies that's going to go through the biggest uh, correction in the next whatever year or two. Well, I, know, I never follow that. So I did not know. I did not <laughs> <Yeah>. know that. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. You have, yeah, it's interesting. But Terry, one thing that I, I really appreciate about you and, and it's something we very, very strongly believe in as well is telling people like it is. And I, I think that yeah. you have that same vibe of, you yeah. know, not just painting 
real estate investing with these rose colored glasses, but really letting people know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that, that that's probably what pe draws people to you. So I, you know, we wish you all the luck in the world with, with your coaching there in Canada and, and your local area there and your book. And just, you seem like a really great person. Yeah, I agree. This has been, it's been a lot of fun. Aww. So thanks for being on. Thanks for having me on. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. This is another episode of the uh, Real Estate of Mind show. One more self flow promotion I'm going to do here. Our brand new book to this hit Amazon, The Birth of the Everyday Real Estate Investor, How uh, Real Estate, Not Stocks, Create Wealth. So go grab your copy there. And while you're there, grab a copy of The Mindful Landlord from Terry also. I'm looking forward to, I'll probably get a copy of that myself. I like the, like the way this all sounds. So great stuff. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review and leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer and please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.